Hi, you're listening to Football Journeys, a B5 consultancy podcast with me, Matt Hemsworth, and my colleague, Fraser Franks. Football Journeys is a podcast that ignores the glitz and the glamour of the beautiful game in favour of the pain, the graft and the rejection. In Series 1, we met Liverpool FC's Academy class of 2013-14. They were 10 impressive young men who lived the roller coaster through the famous Academy at Kirby and beyond, but ultimately missed out on their Anfield dream. If you haven't yet listened to that series, then we strongly recommend that you do. From the boy wonder, dubbed the next Steven Gerrard, to the Spanish lads quickly adapting to English culture and football. The player told at the age of 21 that he'd have to retire before a donation of a new knee gave him a new lease of life and 15 more years of playing. And even the dramatic story of Darius Wardian, who tragically spent time at Her Majesty's pleasure, but is now rebuilding his life. After 10 episodes, we're moving on from this group of lads to tell more and varied stories. We're going to finish off this series with a few bonus episodes that will take us in a completely different direction. This week on Football Journeys, we're working again with our friends at ASM Advisory. One of the themes we discussed with Dean Hammond in this episode is about financial matters and the tendency for footballers to receive bad advice. The need for players who have, of course, a a very short career on the pitch and then need to manage their earnings sensibly, the need for them to get good advice and take slow and sensible decisions, it's something that Amir and the team at ASM feel very strongly about. Um, And we've included some of Amir's thoughts uh, as part of this podcast, and we'll also be sharing um, some of our chat with Amir on social media as well, at Journeys Pod. Uh, You can find ASM on the web at asmadvisory.co.uk, and we are proud to be associated with them. We thank you, Amir and the ASM team. Um, And now it's over to us, Fraser and I, for Football Journeys with Dean Hammond. On this episode, we speak to former Premier League midfielder Dean Hammond. The Brighton boy who came through the ranks at his local club and went on to make over 150 appearances for them. He enjoyed great success as captain of Southampton, where he led them to -to back-to-back promotions and back to the Premier League. He failed to make an appearance in the Premier League for Southampton, but signed for Leicester in the Championship and did it all over again and won promotion to the Premier League. He finally achieved his dream and made his Premier League debut at the age of 31. We speak to Dean about losing his love for football towards the end of his career, his struggles with retirement, alcohol and mistakes that he made financially. Dean shows great honesty and has so much wisdom to pass on to anybody listening. Well, Dean, welcome to the podcast. Welcome to Football Journeys. Thank you very much. It's, it's, it's good to uh, have a good chat and good catch up with you guys. Looking forward to it. Well, quite. I mean, uh, I, I think what we'll probably end up doing is uh, listening to you and Fraser talk because uh, we've, we've met before. We've had a, a good old chinwag and I think there's, there's a lot of shared ethics and principles between the three of us and particularly between you two. Um, on this pod, Dean, we, we, we quite often take people through their careers. And um, if we look at your career from the outside, uh, I think there'll be many people who haven't played the game will look at it. Over 400 games in the Football League uh, and the Premier League. Uh, promotions with Southampton and Leicester. Uh, starting off at your local or, or your closest league club, Brighton Hove Albion. It kind of looks like one of those, I wouldn't quite call it Roy of the Rovers, but a fantastic career. Um, and I think most people from outside the game think you must be an incredibly happy man. And I know you are a happy man, but I don't think that kind of really tells the tale. Um, so if we can kind of take you back to the beginning when life was simple, um, tell us a little bit about, you know, those kind of early days where I guess life was a bit more simple. You come from a hardworking family, talented kid, Hastings boy, go up the road, play for the academy at Brighton, and it's just football, football, football. Yeah, exactly that, Matt, to be honest. Um, I joined um, Brighton of Albion School of Excellence at 11 years old. Um, I worked my way through to uh, 16, where I left school and um, committed to, to the YT, YTS scheme, which is full-time football, um, which is a three-year contract um, at Brighton of Albion, and, and, and loved that, loved every minute of that, loved the journey, um, loved the challenges, um, always wanted to be a professional footballer. There was nothing really else that interests me, um, nothing else that I was particularly talented at. Um, I suppose I found my passion very, very early in life. So I was fortunate in, in that respect. Um, and then just kind of worked my way through to, to the first team. But, you know, I learned a lot of lessons and um, football lessons and life lessons during that uh, youth team period and had a great bunch of lads and, and, and two really good coaches in Dean Wilkins and, and Martin Hinchwood who were brilliant for me, uh, not only for my football, but like I mentioned, in terms of teaching you to be a good human being. Uh, which is really important, I think, in football and sets you up for life. So 
no, that's where it all started. And I made my debut at 17 and, and so my, uh, for, well, signed my first professional contract at 19 years of old, uh, age. Sorry. Um, those, those two years, are, I think you, you would have been one of the last sort of years. I think I was the last year of the old school YTS where it, still, it depends on the club, but there's still room for jobs and stuff like that. Was that a proper old school? You did every job around the training ground, cooked the food, cleaned the boots. And then talking, touching on your teammates, were there many of you that went through to get pro contracts out of that bunch? Because I look back at my own and the transition was quite different then. You had to go from 18th football straight into first team football. And there weren't really, especially at the club I was at, there weren't really an in-between. So was there many, many of your lads that ended up going through and becoming professionals elsewhere as well? Um, not too many. There was In my age group, there was me and Chris McPhee, who went on and played for uh, Brighton. Um, I think at one stage, he was the youngest ever player to play for Brighton. I think he made his debut at 16. Um, and then he went on to play for Torquay, Exeter, um, teams like that. Um, Adam uh, Hinchelwood, um, who went on to play for England under-21s and the Brighton first team, but had to retire really early through, through knee surgery, knee injuries. Um, he's now manager uh, at Worthing um, and doing a really good job there. Dan Harding came through as well, who had a really good career um, at Leeds United, um, started obviously at Brighton, uh, then moved on to Leeds, Nottingham Forest, Southampton, where we had the promotions we played again together there. Um, but not uh, Adam Lab, sorry, came through as well, who obviously had a, a big career at um, Brighton of Albion. So not massive amounts, really talented groups, um, but not too many came through. Um, because when I grew up, they used to really take two or three from the age group. That was it, because the clubs couldn't afford to take on five, six, seven, eight players and, and take them on and, and allow them to develop. It was more if you were ready, you were ready. And if not, unfortunately you had to be moved on which has changed completely now um, but the jobs were still there I, we used to love the jobs I mean it was it was part and parcel it was part of learning your trade it was part of time to get you get time with the first team as well which I thought was really important you know that was tough um, because they were um, a really experienced group um, a ruthless group but you got time to spend with them and, and learn things off them as well. So clean their boots, cleaning the dressing room, cleaning the balls. Um, we used to go and clean the stadium, um, take the kit to the laundry. Um, but I loved all that. You know, it just, especially within our group of, of youth team players, um, there were some real characters. And we, you know, we used to get in at probably eight o'clock in the morning, uh, probably wouldn't leave till probably four in the afternoon. But there was, I can't remember one day where we really moaned. They had to pull us in from the training ground because we used to love playing football. And the jobs, we just used to have good fun. So, um, yeah, it was real, really good memories from, from that period. And still got a lot of friends from that time as well. Fraser, I know you say this. Is your apprenticeship can be some of the happiest times of your footballing career. Oh, well, I think I think when you when you become a first-team player, there's a, lot, there's a lot of stuff that comes with it. A lot of great stuff, but a lot of the the politics behind it and maybe new contracts and money and all that. But you, when you, when, you know, when you go from school to a YTS or, you know, a scholarship now, you go from earning nothing to all of you on the same amount of money. It doesn't matter who's on what you're playing with each other every week. You're, you're training full time. The jobs as well. I was, I was in a similar situation that we, we absolutely loved it. And my, you know, two of my youth team were best men at my wedding. We still, I've got like a WhatsApp chat, still really good friends amongst it. And I think it's a, uh, it is. It's, it, I think when you look back and you think, um, you know, when you're young lads and you're just going into it, it is most people will say it's the best two years of your life. And I'd say 90 percent of my youth team will, will still say that as well. Everyone goes off into their, their own different directions. A lot didn't become footballers, but you look at that stage and you think they were some unbelievable times. So. It gives you sorry, mate. it gives you an incentive as well. Sorry, mate. it gives you an incentive when you're. When you're a young player, you know, that two, three years you, you spend as a YTS. I was on, I think I was on £40 a week. Money didn't even enter my mind. I, it didn't matter. And like Fraser mentioned there, everyone's equal. So you're just there to play football. And, and that made it great because there was no pressures. There was no worries. You didn't need money because you didn't have time to spend your money. You know, you weren't getting home. I used to get the train in the morning from Hastings to Brighton, which was an hour and a half. I'd, I'd, I'd have to leave my house at what, half six in the morning, quarter uh, about six o'clock. And then, you know, I wouldn't finish till four. I wouldn't be home till half past five. And then you go again the next day, probably have one day off a week. One of the highlights for us, we used to get a Friday fiver. 
so you on a Friday that the youth team manager used to give us five pounds and it was like Christmas you know five pound was a lot of money when you're only on 40 pound a week so them sort of things are just things it brings really good close relationships and like Fraser mentioned there you make some really good friendships and I've got a lot of friends that were still close because of the youth team day so yeah brilliant times they really are I think when you touch on the jobs as well I do think that there's a massive place for that in football then but yeah. still to this day I know a lot of it is seen as old school and that kind of thing but as you said developing relationships with first team players we we spoke to you know a group of, of academy players that came through Liverpool system on our first series and a lot of the time they were training with the first team for the first time and they were at a different training ground to the first team so their first experience of you know Steven Gerrard and Torres and Suarez and people like this is when they're chucked in a training session whereas when you're doing jobs and you've got a little relationship with one player or you're cleaning his boots or you're in the changing room and they can see your face or speak to you even when you do step up to train you know a few of them or you you know whoever I clean their boots they're going to look after me a little bit or introduce me to the boys I think it's still massive and as you say developing those relationships with first team players copying what they do seeing what they eat how they conduct themselves still a massive part for that for me. Oh, massively, because, I mean, I used to clean them. We used to have to clean the manager's car every Friday. So, you know, you'd get to know the manager as well. Yes, he'd be giving you stick and, and probably taking the mickey out of you, but you get to speak to him. Uh, you get to have a little bit of a relationship with him. You had to go upstairs, you know, where Brighton was. We were at a really small dressing uh, training ground. But you'd have to go and clean the bath and clean the toilets and things like, and things like that. So you learned life skills. You really did. You know, we talk about what happens when you, you finish your career and players don't really know how to live their life because they've been looked after and cared for for such a long period. I think during them youth team days, you can learn so much. You, you really can. They're so valuable. Yes, there was probably some negatives about it as well. Um, but I think in the modern day, if you can find the balance between the two, I think you'll get it right then. One of the things, one of the words I like that, that you used the last time we spoke, Dean, was um, awareness. And um, we, we spoke at the beginning, lads that came through. So your U team, you had yourself, Chris McPhee, Adam Hinchywood, Dan Harding, lads like that. But of course, the vast majority don't make it as a football player. Um, what you describe is an environment where lads are enjoying themselves, but they are putting their body on the line, they're working hard, and they're working hard towards this dream. Now, I know that, that, that young Dean was football, 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 no real plan about what happens when you get to 35 or however old you'll be when your career ends or if you have a knee problem uh, and you end early. Um, you, we speak a lot about awareness when we spoke to you. I mean, can you just sort of, well, for our listeners' benefit, sort of explain what, what, what you mean by that in terms of um, the, the, the realistic prospect of making it as a football player? Well, obviously, it's, it's, it's really, really low. Uh, what a level, whatever level you're you're competing at or playing at um, when you're coming through uh, either a school of excellence as academy now or a, a YTS or youth team um, period before 18s, 23s before you can get a pro contract and go into the first team. So I think it's more just been, from my experiences and me reflecting on my career, it's been aware that there's a big chance that you might not make it. There, there really is. Now, I didn't have a plan B at the time, but I was aware that I might not make it. And I was comfortable with that. I was fine with that. You know, I wanted to give everything to my career, give myself every opportunity to try and be a professional footballer because that was my dream. That was my passion. But I wasn't naive enough to think it was definitely going to happen. But I was comfortable with that. So I think in today's world in today's academies I think it's making players parents more aware that there's a chance that your 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 kids may not make it and making them aware of that and then still allowing them to make the choice and go well okay I still want to give this a try I still want to give that this my best to become a professional footballer and if I don't make it there's no regrets I don't look back and think well you know if I tried a little bit harder or if I dedicate myself a little bit more I could have become a professional footballer I would rather live with the fact that I gave it everything and didn't make it than look back and regret it. So what I mean by awareness is, is being aware of the situation. There's a chance that you might not make it, but there's also a chance that you could. And, you know, and I always looked at it in that respect thinking, but what if I could make it? What a life that would be? What if I could achieve my dream? 
that's just that motivated me that inspired me that made me work hard so it is just being aware of every bit of the situation and then making a decision on it it is that it is just that awareness that you talk about and having these conversations because you can't I try and get the balance right when I'm talking to young players now and for me it was football or nothing and that was my that was my attitude growing up so like you I don't know what my reaction would have been it would have been tough for me so now we try and get them to be a little bit more rounded, whether that's them talking about something else or having a different interest. It doesn't mean that they're not committed, but I also look back and I think you have to be obsessed and you have to commit to it. If you go into it like that and you know that, that it might not work out and I need to do this, but I also think that you can commit to it and have other interests as well or, or have a little, not so much of a backup plan because I think how it was put to us was, what are you going to do if you don't become a professional footballer? And I think now the question needs to be reframed to even if you do become a professional footballer, you finish at this, you know, at 35 anyway, if you're lucky. So then you've got to do something else afterwards anyway. So you might as well start thinking about it while you're young. You don't have to go and do a degree or go and do a course, but start having these thoughts and, you know, exploring a few different ideas. And that's, that's, that's the balance that, yes, it's hard to get right at times because, you know, not everyone can become a footballer and we have to look after people that drop out and people that go on. So it's a balance that, it's probably different at every club and different for every player, but it's definitely just that awareness of the industry that you're going into, I think. I mean, I agree 100 percent Fraser. It's about understanding. It's about having it's about having them other interests, but them interests not becoming a distraction. I think that's the biggest difference where you're right, during your football career, once you are a professional footballer, you get so much time on your hands. You do get a lot of time in the afternoons, a lot of time to maybe consider well could I be doing something else or could I be educating myself on something that I may want to go into after my career or could I start a side business why I'm playing football I think that's completely fine as long as it doesn't distract you from your main focus or your main goals I think that's where it can it can come a little bit blurred and you look at players and you think okay well why is he dropped off why is he not so dedicated and there's nothing wrong with that at all but I think for me, as a, my personality and a player was, I had to be wholehearted and whole committed to get everything out of myself that I could to try and get to the level that I wanted to get to. But yes, I do agree, during my, my career, could I have spent them more free hours learning a little bit more, reading a few more books, speaking to a few more players and understanding what they're potentially doing? Because there's huge value in that. You know, how many players through the history of football have gone through a football career? You'd love to speak to them and go, okay, well, what did you do? What didn't you do? What could you have done? What do you wish you had done? I love speaking to players now and, and asking them the question, if you could do your career again, what would you do differently on and off the pitch? And you get some valuable answers. So I think you can get a lot of information and a lot of advice by just speaking to people. And, and people that have been through it are very, very willing to, to talk to you. They really are. Well, that brings it quite nicely back to back to your career. And you talked about living that dream or you had that dream and then you, you've gone on and lived it. So you've had a, you've had a good career. You've had 136 league games for, for Brighton and Hope Avenue, your local club. Uh, you've gone on to Southampton. You got promoted to the Premier League with Southampton. Then go back to Leicester within the Championship. You get promoted to the Premier League with Leicester. So your dream was, I'm going to be a Premier League football player. You ultimately realised that. Uh, how old were you? 30, 31, 32? At that yeah, 30, 30, 31 or 32, I think it was something like that, Matt, around now, that age. Now, we know from previous conversations with you, but this is what we really want to explore. It seems a strange thing to do with a great career that you've had to take from scholarship and then go straight to the age of 30. But you talk about being just a football player and focusing and being obsessed and doing all the right things. And lots of young lads that came through some of those clubs talk about you as that good professional they looked up, up to. And Alex Oxlade-Chamberlain was a young lad at Southampton. He looked at you, the, the way that you did the right things with your body, et cetera, et cetera. So you've got that drilled focus on that dream, which is to your credit, which is why you managed to achieve it. But, but we know from the, our chats too that by the time you get to about 30, it's actually in terms of your mindset, your mental health, et cetera, where you start to, I think the, um, it would be overstating to say you lost your way because you didn't have huge problems, but you started to have little problems there that, that made life a bit difficult for you. Yeah, I mean, I became, we're talking about awareness again. I thought I was on the right path. And potentially if I look back on my career and on and off the pitch, I was on the right path, but I got distracted. We talked about distraction before and I got influenced a little bit more. Um, because of the stage I was at in my career where 
you know, during that period from, I suppose, 16 to 30 to 31, I just, my life was very, very simple. I played football. I was chasing a dream. I saved a lot of money. I didn't invest in things. I was moving slowly up the property market, which we all get told to do, buy a house, add some value to the house, move on to the next one. I was growing a family. So I was in a pretty strong position um, when, when I actually reached the Premier League. Um, but I was, I was introduced to someone in terms of a financial advisor um, through, through some other players within the dressing room. Um, and had a meeting and I was pretty proud of the position I was in from where I'd come from, from a hardworking family in, in Hastings and I was doing okay. Um, but I got influenced and, um, by a financial advisor putting a seed in my mind saying, well, okay, well, you, you know, you're probably going to play to your 35, but you've probably got another 50 or 60 years after that. The money you've got now is not going to last you. Now that hit home really, really hard to me. Because then I started panicking and thinking, okay, well, I need to use the money I've got. I need to invest the money I've got. I need to grow this money I've got for long-term investment. And I was persuaded to do that. And that's where my problems or challenges really, really started. Because my, 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 my mentality suddenly switched from, from being very strict with my money, from, from saving, um, from, from planning, to then suddenly being... I suppose, gambling with my money in investments that I didn't really understand. That was the major problem. I didn't really understand what I was invested in. I started to do it because other players were doing it that I suppose I trusted at the time. I met a financial advisor who, I suppose, persuaded me that this was the right direction to go, showed me some numbers, showed me some examples, but not proof. And I believed that. And it was all down to the fact that I knew my career was, you know, I probably had four or five years left. I wasn't going to be earning this money um, after that period. And I needed to do more. And that's where my confusion and my distractions, I suppose, came in. And then that started affecting my, my football career as well. There's quite a few themes in that. There's dressing room environments. There's that element of your career ebbing away. And therefore, you know, you're aging, you know, you've only got five years left. So you're just kind of trying to cling on to what you can maximise. Um, and then you've got what happens a lot in football, seeing people seeing footballers as, as a potential cash cow. Um, I don't know which one to focus on first, but I mean, Fraser and I talk to a lot of young lads about that dressing room environment, that, that kind of peer pressure uh, that happens. And we see it in a, a very modern version of it is that kind of Instagram lifestyle. Uh, that idea of the baller lifestyle, um, you know, wanting the Balenciaga trainers and wanting to, you know, uh, suggest that you've, you know, you're, you're, you're living that lifestyle, you're driving high power cars, et cetera, and going, kind of going along with the crowd with it. And it's a really interesting thing, that dressing room environment. I mean, did you feel at that point where you're getting introduced by these players? Well, they're investing in it. They, they persuaded me to invest in it. I need to show that I'm part of this group by investing in it. Kind of, kind of, Matt, to be honest. Yes, it is a status thing. Yes, it is a pride. There's some pride in it to, to kind of prove to yourself that you, you have the ability to invest in it. I was never massively influenced in terms of, I wasn't in the one that would into the material things really, wouldn't be buying, you know, expensive watches or um, expensive cars. I'd have a nice family car, of course. I was more into um, putting my money into to houses uh, and, and making my home nice and, and sending my kids to private school, that was really important to me. But I suppose I was influenced because, yes, I, the dressing room used to talk about these investments and they'd, they'd be um, saying, well, we're going to make this money. This is really exciting. This is a brilliant thing to do. This is what footballers need to be doing. The financial advisors um, come up with some really, really good ideas. So you do get influenced in that and it gets your mind thinking and thinking, well, okay, well, if I don't do this, I'm really going to miss out. And you start panicking from that point of view again if I don't do this and it really works out for the players this is a mistake on my part and that's how you feel at the time so I think that's where the influence comes from within the dressing room and these were experienced players that I were talking to that were more experienced than, than me at the time um, so I listened to them and believed in them but the problem is you never know the story behind it you never know what those players are potentially getting out of the investment as well you don't know how close they are with the financial advisor. Um, 
And I always say it's it's more about understanding what you're investing in. That's where I fell down. You know, I take full responsibility for, I'm not blaming anyone. I take responsibility for what I invested in. But where I feel as though I let myself down is that I wasn't aware of what I was investing in. I didn't know exactly the details of it. I didn't know the small print. I didn't know exactly how it's going to work out. And one of the biggest things, I didn't really know why I was doing it. There was no plan. I don't know. I didn't know where I was heading. The numbers just excited me. And that was that was the issue. Um, now, we obviously can't go into too much detail because it's still subject to legal proceedings and wranglings. But um, just so that the listeners can get an idea of the kind of numbers we're talking about, it's not been ruinous for you, but you, you've lost a lot of money on, on this investment. That's right. Yeah, I mean, I'm fortunate in the fact that I've invested in other things and kind of um, split my money and used it for other things as well. But you're talking hundreds of thousands of pounds. Yeah, it's a, it's a lot of money that you should not be investing in if you don't understand what you're invested in. And you shouldn't be trusting someone that you've just been introduced to and probably shouldn't be trusting people within a dressing room that I'd only been there or I was only on loan. This, this happened when I was on Brighton, when I went back to Brighton on loan. So very very naive on my part it really is was I influenced yes was I played yes but I have to take responsibility as well so I was the problem with football and Fraser will probably tell you this the football doesn't get money doesn't get spoken about a lot in football no one really knows what anyone's on in terms of wages everyone bumps it up because of the pride thing saying well I'm on more of this and you you want to demonstrate that you're earning a lot of money and you're really really important but the numbers never get mentioned so you're always guessing. So was I naive in the fact that I probably should have gone and spoke more to more players? Have they invested in this? Not only have they invested it, has, has it happened? Has there been an outcome from it? Has there been a result from it? Have they actually made some money from this? So it was all, all numbers, figures, um, and probably a bit of laziness as well. You know, Because I was so dedicated to my, to my football career, I just wanted to concentrate on playing. I had some savings. I wanted to invest it to, um, to make more money. Um, and I've come to peace with it now in terms of the fact that I think I was doing the right thing. I just chose the wrong person to invest with. But one thing I will say is over the last three or four years, I've learned a hell of a lot of stuff that I can take into the future and potentially can help other people with. And this is why we're doing this. So there is some positives from it because I'm not scared. I'm not one who's now is going to sit in a dressing room and be quiet because it happens a lot and if anyone wants to speak to me or whatever about it I'm very honest in, in what's happened in my life now and that's a, that's a good thing I think that we should all be here to to, to help each other 100% and it comes down to trust as well it, it really does um, you feel as though you can trust people in, in your career because when you go out onto a football pitch you play as a team you fight for each other you die for each other so you feel as though off the pitch that would go, that would be a a given as well and that was one of my mistakes as well because I'm very trustworthy in people I believe in what people say um, and I think there's a saying that you know there's your there's your side their side and in the middle there's the truth so I think you just have to go and follow that sort of guide but it, it needs to be talked about it more because it shouldn't happen you know players shouldn't be taken advantage of we spoke to Amir from ASM Advisory and got his thoughts on some of the financial issues he sees in football. If you look at a lot of people who have grown businesses, they've organically grown over a number of years. So they've, they've built their business, they've learned from mistakes, they've, they've learned from what's a good investment, what's not a good investment. And that, that tends to be over like a 25 year period or 30 year period. I think with footballers, now you're getting kids at 18 years of age being lumbered with £20,000 a week. Now, there's, there's a responsibility to, I think, from the clubs, I think from the people around them, from their family, um, to really sort of nurture that. And, and one of the points I, sort of, I, I thought was quite poignant was, if you look at a player, they'll have a physio for their body. You know, they'll have a nutritionist for their health, you know, their diet. They'll have coaches in terms of how they can improve their performance. But they don't have um, a financial person or an accountant or someone around them to really sort of help them give that guidance. And, and that, to me, is, is when you actually think about it in, in those sort of simple forms, it's actually quite an important aspect. It's, it's an important issue because, yes, they're playing football and that's what they need to focus on. 
but they also need that that financial support and you know i was listening to what dean was saying and and yeah you've got the changing room mentality you know people sitting there going well i'm doing this i'm doing that whether it's ego whether it's 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 one upmanship or it's it's keeping up with the joneses so to speak the 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 results are it's the same as anything it's not just football it happens in anything you know, a number of times i'll get a client they'll go well i spoke to this person down the pub it's the same sort of thing people talk without really thinking about actually well what what are they talking about and, and i thought one thing was very poignant with dean is the fact that he said i didn't really research i didn't look at it i didn't analyze it enough in terms of what i was doing and that is really important because you know i've taken on footballers and and some of them the first sort of sort of six months of my engagement with them is actually sorting out the stuff they've they've done in the past and when you sort of quiz them go well who's invested that what is that well i don't really know you know why is that Who, who's told you that where's the person who's done it oh he's done a runner he's not around anymore and that is all too familiar and that's not right um let's move to a little bit of positivity because there's so many wonderful things that happen in your career and we're only going to brush over them because we we kind of we want to we want to draw we want to use you as a cash cow knowledge um, but we're doing a talk about the, some of the good times. In 2013-14 season, you're at Leicester. And that's that season where the club pick up 102 points. You get promotion uh, and you end up in the Premier League. So that is, you know, you, you've sat down figuratively at the age of 16 and said, this is a Dean Hammond master plan. I'm going to get to the Premier League. That is the point at which you do. I mean, just talk to us a little bit about that season. Let's dwell on a little bit of positivity. I mean, that must have been an incredible season to be a Leicester City player. I mean, it was, it, it really, really was. I mean, I'd had the promotions at Southampton. I'd actually got to the Premier League, but never got the opportunity to play in the Premier League and, and went back on loan to Brighton. We got to the playoff semi-finals in the championship and, and lost in the semi-finals and then went to Leicester, um, which was a brilliant move. It was a club that I always kind of watched from afar, thinking they're a good club. You know, they're, they're a Premier League club playing in the championship. I was aware of the players and the squad that were, were at. Leicester before I signed because they'd lost in the playoff semi-final as well. If you remember that goal at Watford where they missed a penalty and Troy Deeney went down the other end and scored. Um, and I was very aware of the manager in, in Nigel Pearson because he'd been at Southampton before and, and people at Southampton have spoken very highly of him. Um, so when I signed at the football club, I was, I was aware of you know what we were heading towards. The owners were very, very ambitious, um, put a lot of money into the football club. Um, and it was good for me there, to be honest. I, I loved it. The dressing room was brilliant. Um, we had some amazing players. You know, we had Jamie Vardy there, Casper Smichael, Wes Morgan, Danny Dreamwater, Riyad Mahrez, Anthony Knockard. Um, I'm forgetting a lot of players, but, you know, David Nugent. And made a lot of friends there, which was great. Um, and we played some brilliant stuff. We really did. You know, the, David Nugent and Jamie Vardy up front just terrorised the fence. And, and we won the league very, very convincingly. Um, the atmosphere within the group was brilliant. I used to love training there because training was hugely intense, you know, really, really intense, played at a really high tempo, but it was short bursts. So we wouldn't train for long, but the players would still be around the dressing room. The training ground was pretty tight knit, you know, everyone mixed in together, whether it was the youth team, the 23s, the dinner ladies, the laundry ladies, the people that worked in the offices. It was all on a small sort of location. So the atmosphere was great. Um, but yeah, one of the one of the happiest times of of my career, and the family were living in Hampshire at the time, and I was kind of commuting as well. Uh, we had lots of days off, so it, it worked for the family as well. So yeah, brilliant times, and I mean, I played with some fantastic players, and I'm very very lucky and grateful for that. Um, but to win the championship so convincingly was was brilliant. And was it a bit was it a bit like job done though? Um, you'd had that master plan. You completed it. You became a Premier League player. Well, it's interesting you say that, Matt, in the fact that when I actually went into the, the next season, I was a little bit nervous because I'd done the same at Southampton. We got promoted and I was, was I going to get the opportunity to play in the Premier League? I was pretty realistic and thinking this is my last chance, if I'm honest. Um, went away in the summer and worked ridiculously hard. Came back really, really fit. Um, and just thought, well, look, what can I control? I can control how fit I am. I can control how mentally prepared I am to try and get this opportunity at Leicester. You know, it was difficult. We ended up signing an Esther Van Cambiasso. So it was another bit of competition in centre of field, which I thought, OK, this is going to be another challenge. Um, but I was lucky in the fact that um, I had a really good pre-season. 
I didn't start the first game of the season. And then a central midfield player got injured. Matty James got injured on the build-up to the first game. And then Danny Drinkwater got injured 10 minutes into the game. So I came on um, against Everton um, and then played the next 12 games in a row and, and really, really enjoyed that and loved the experience. Felt very, very comfortable at that level. Um, but had a lot of injuries that season as well because I had to push my body to the limits to play at that level. Um, and it affected me. But one thing I will say is that it was the beginning of the end for me, if that makes sense, because I'd reached my dream, because I'd reached that end of the rainbow, I'd reached that pot of gold in terms of my career. Um, and I didn't set new goals. I didn't set a new focus. Uh, and I fell down there because I kind of, I lost my passion a little bit. I lost my direction. What was I heading for next? It always been the Premier League. It was almost like an impossible dream which I just continued to chase, whether I got knocked down, whether I was being successful. It was always, can I play in the Premier League? Now, looking back at the time, once I'd made, got into the Premier League, once I'd played the games, I should have just sat down, sat down with my agent, sat down with my family and go, OK, what's next for me? Can I continue to play in the Premier League? Can we have a good cut run? Can I become a consistent Premier League player? But I didn't do that and I regret that massively. Because the result was, I mean, you ended up not that long afterwards getting say, getting shipped out. Sheffield United's a great club, but you ended up going to Sheffield United, and um, I mean, you played you played a full season at Bramall Lane. But I, I know you talk about that being the beginning of the end, and huge respect that you got for Sheffield United. But I don't think that was that's a season that was happy for you, at least in your mindset, your well being. No, it wasn't. Um, I went to Sheffield United on loan to uh, kind of um, work under Nigel Atkins again, who I'd worked at, uh, at Southampton and Dean Wilkins, so I had to trust in them. And if I'm honest, my confidence was a little bit low because of the rejection I'd received at, at, at Leicester um, and, and wasn't playing um, and was allowed to leave the club. Wasn't encouraged to leave the club, but was allowed to. Um, and you, your confidence gets hit a little bit for, for as a player. And I wanted to go and play under a manager that wanted me to be there. So drop from the Premier League to, to League One is quite a big drop, really. Um, but was signing for a big club and was excited to play for Sheffield United because it was similar to when I signed for, for Southampton. You know, a big club in League One, could we get to the Championship and then could they go again? And that was the, the aim and the target, really. Um, but my form was poor. Uh, I didn't perform well at all. Um, I suffered with a few niggly injuries. I was travelling from home again. My wife was pregnant. So mentally, I wasn't quite there. Um, and because my performances were, were poor, I was trying even harder. I was working even harder, which had an effect on me. And it's a, a negative effect. And I did fall out of love with the game, to be honest. Um, I wasn't well received by the fans at Sheffield United. I was always trying to prove myself. And I felt that that weight on my shoulders. So I couldn't just play my natural game. I couldn't just play instinctively. I was always worrying about what people were thinking about me. Um, so yeah, it was a tough, tough period, if I'm honest, during, during that loan period. Um, and I felt the effects of it. And like I say, I fell out of love with the game at the end of that season when my contract finished at Leicester um, and the loan finished at Sheffield United. I suppose I kind of walked away from the game. Um, I made up the excuse I was going to have a rest because we just had our third child. But really, deep down, I was probably running away because um, I was affected by my poor performances and, and um, not playing too well. My confidence was shot, to be honest. It's remarkable to go from that point of realising your dream, what, two seasons ago, to dropping out the game altogether at that point. But you said something I was really fascinated by when you talked about Sheffield United you were not well received by the fans. And I think like, I taught this talk as a fan. Players really feel that, do they? That they know that they're not popular. They know that the majority of the fans don't rate them. You do. And I was one that was never on social media. Now, I'm, I'm, I use social media now because I think it's a powerful tool. But when I played, I didn't really use it. So I wasn't like one that was scrolling through social media and, and sensing the feedback and getting the feedback. It was more while I was playing, to be honest, more before the game in terms of little things. And it might seem strange and it might seem nothing, but Fraser would tell, you know, when your name gets um, uh, 
called out before a game, you know, your name, number seven, Dean Hammond, blah, blah, blah. And some players get a loud cheer and some don't. Now, I was one that hardly got a cheer, so you feel the effects from that. You would be the, the target of criticism. I'd be the first one to target of criticism because I was a so-called high-profile player coming in from a Premier League club to a League One club. I should be the best player on the pitch every week. I wasn't performing, so I'd be the first one to get the criticism. Um, the reporters, the local reporters, you know, the way they interviewed me, I sensed it. They didn't really appreciate me there. And um, the questions they asked me were tough questions. And I had to deal with it because obviously you're live and what you say gets written. Um, and I must admit, within the dressing room, the players were brilliant with me, like really, really good with me. But I felt as though I hadn't proved myself to them. And I felt that was though there was question marks from them on me. Um, in terms as a player, not as a person, but as a player. So you, d you do feel it and it affects your game because you start questioning yourself. And when you can't play the game naturally, you know, as a, as a footballer, the higher you go up, you've got to be knowing what you're going to do before you get the ball. You've got to be thinking ahead. And if, but every time if you're thinking as the ball comes to you, don't give it away. Don't give it away. Don't make another mistake. You're going to make a mistake. And then when you make a mistake, you try to do something different, which is not natural to your player. You know, I was a player that, would keep the ball, work really hard, win the ball back, get it to the better players. But because I continued to make mistakes, I'm suddenly trying to hit diagonal passes. I'm suddenly trying to take two or three players on and I lose the ball. So it makes it worse. So it does affect you as a player. I'm, I, I, I'd love to sit here and say, no, look, we're all thick skin. It doesn't matter. But it does. I think that's the, it's a masculine environment and that's what you want to say. And that's probably what I said as a player. At that time, I probably said, oh, it doesn't affect me. But I, I remember when I signed for Luton, and I started off really well there. But like, I was probably the opposite of you, where you say you were trying to prove yourself, but you were a Premier League player coming down. I was a non-league player coming up, and I was trying to prove myself because there was other egos, and I knew most players were earning a bit more money than me. And yeah, it was. I found the dressing room, right, I have to start it well here, and I have to get accepted first of all. But when you do start, I remember starting well, but I remember my form dipping a little bit at Luton. And it's not the you know the the same scale of club, but it is. We were getting ten thousand week in week out, and we were a big team in the league and expected to win. And just those little those little moments, it wasn't it wasn't like you're getting booed as you're walking out, but it's the really subtle bits. Like someone would give a pass away, and it, it wouldn't really get you know a, a reaction. Then you would, and you get a big ah, oh, and it does. And the next one, you're like right. Instead of thinking you know, positively, and I'm going to keep this ball, I'm going to do something good with it. You're like, right, let me get rid of this or let me shift this on to someone else or whatever I do, don't make a mistake. And it is, it's a, you do feel that. And I think it's probably going to be an interesting point with no crowds in and there's been no crowds in for a year. A lot of players have made their debuts and haven't really experienced this. And then when crowds come back in, it's a different element to deal with because it. I'm, I'm the same. I'd love to say that, you know, idiot shouting things in the crowd at times didn't affect me. But if it's your own fans, I think it does, and it it's hard to it's hard to completely ignore it. I think, especially with the added thing of social media these days as well. I remember my last ever professional football match. It was at Sheffield United. I just had my my third child. We'd been in the hospital three days. Um, I hadn't trained. Um, went into spoke to Nigel on the on the uh, Friday. I got into the training ground and said, Look, I want you to play tomorrow. It's the last game of the season. We're building for next season. I want you to play. Let's finish the season with a win. I was like, Gaffer, I haven't slept in two, three days. I haven't like trained, but if you want me to play, I'll play because I trusted him. And that was the sort of character I was. Anyway, we ended up playing Scumfort. We got beat 2-0. I had a poor performance first half. And I came off at half time and I was willing to come off. In my mind, I'm like, please just take me off. Like, I'm done here. This couldn't get any worse. Obviously, as I'm sitting in the dressing room, Bramwell Lane's a big stadium. I'm sitting in the dressing room all, all on my own. So there's no one in the dressing room. I'm all on my own. And you can hear the, the, over the tanner, the, the speaker, making the announcement of, of the half time substitution. And I'd never heard such a big cheer when my name had come off. And I sat there and I thought, yeah, that's me done. That's me done. I got changed, went home at halftime, which I'd never done, which showed a little bit of disrespect towards the players in the club. But I was just so out of love with football that I just got in my car, went home um, and, and just didn't come back really. And, and that was in, that was the final moment of my career. So all the success I'd had finished on me getting taken off at halftime and um, being cheered for taking off. So it took me a while to get over that, I must admit.
I bet it did. Do you know what? I was just about to say, summarise, that's amazing. Your last ever game of glittering career. You talked about 10 to 12 years of, of success going up, 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 up. And that's how it ends. And I think that's quite, that's actually probably much more typical than people would admit within the game. Ignominious ends to careers. It's not all, you know, David Beckham getting substituted for PSG and crying, um, you know, after he's just achieved everything he's all achieved. Uh, all careers do end, I guess, when you kind of realise that it's not going the way you wanted it to. Um, but talk to us about ending your football career. I mean, what is it What is it like to have lived what, a life which people like me are insanely jealous of and then have it be over? Look, it's, it's, it's tough. Um, what I have to say, I'm very grateful and, and, and appreciative of my career. You know, I live my dream. I'd never moan and I'd never swap anything now. Sitting here now as we're talking, I wouldn't swap a thing. The good times, the bad things, the good experience, the bad experience. I wouldn't change a thing because it's made me the person I am today. And I'm, I'm grateful for that as well. But when you come out of the game, we talk about awareness again. I, I had no idea how I was going to feel. You always consider as a player when you're coming out of the game, what's my financial situation going to be? Can I continue to live? You don't appreciate or think about how am I going to feel emotionally you know um, I, how am I going what am I going to do next what's going to be my passion what's going to be my direction in life because I was 34 years old I think I was 33 34 I think when I finished you know I'm not even halfway through my life so uh, you're sitting there and you think within football Fraser will tell you at 34 you feel like an old man and you're not, you're a young man in, in normal society, but in football, you feel like an old man. You get called an old man in the dressing room. You come out of the game and it's really tough because you don't know what to do. I'm thinking, and obviously I've had the bad experience and so my confidence, not only in my football, but myself has gone. I just got, we just had our, our third child. So I'm having to be a dad and deal with that experience again with two older children. Um, obviously my wife's going through all different emotions and we're trying to, um, kind of put our life together and organise our life with three children now. Um, so I love that, don't get me wrong, but I, I miss football massively. It's, you have to understand, I think, it's coming out as a footballer, you, you, need a you need a time to grieve. It's like losing a loved one because you can continue to be in football as in a coach, a media, uh, an agent, a mentor, whatever you like, but you can never go back and play the game. And I don't mean go back and play the game because... We could all continue to play now, football, but I mean playing at your best. There's no difference, you know, when you're playing at your best in football, there's no better feeling. There really isn't. You feel fit, you feel confident, you're doing something you love. Um, so when I finished the game, I didn't have a purpose. I lost my identity as, as a person and I struggled for, for a long period. It is, you, get, you come out and you've got... I think using the academy system or the school of excellence system from the age of 10 11 was it 12 yeah and you go you go from that so 20 odd years of, of your, your week building up to a saturday and you know you, you know what you're doing monday you know what time you're in you know what you're doing tuesday you've probably got a day off wednesday everything's structured you know what hotel you're going to what you're going to eat everything gears towards that weekend and then when you come out of it it's like what am i you know what am I gearing to now or what am I doing today what, what's my plan today and when you come out it's the way I came out as well but I, I remember saying um, I went to bed every single night from the age of probably six years old and what I thought about when my head hit the pillow was football whether that was me scoring a goal whether it was me lifting a trophy or if I had a game the next day it was running through things in my head and I remember coming out and putting my, my head on the pillow and thinking what do I what do I dream about now what do I what is there to to look forward to now and I'm working with Matt. I'm not going to dream about myself doing this. And it, it's, it's hard. It, it's, you, it's something you've done for, you know, subconsciously for years and years. But that was something I remember having my head on the pillow and just thinking, what, what's next? What am I going to, you know, I need something to, to get me out of bed and to buzz about. And, you know, you've had that adrenaline rush. And there's times during my career where I wished I had a normal job and that, you know, my mates, would they look like they're having such a good time that I've got no pressure in their jobs they go out at the weekend, they haven't got to, you know, worry about this, worry about that. But when it's like, and, you know, you're thinking, I'll put myself under pressure, I've got to perform, these fans are on my back. But when you come out of it, you're like, God, I, I wish I want that pressure back and I want that that feeling back. But how did you, I know we're going to come on to it in a minute, but how did you find that you coped with that or what were the things that you used to cope with uh, with coming out of the game? 
Well, I think to start with, Fraser, I definitely didn't cope with it. Um, and I wasn't aware that I was suffering, to be honest. I think that was one of the biggest problems because I didn't speak to people. I hid away. I, I put that mask on of, of course, everything's all right. I've been a professional footballer. You know, I'm financially OK. Um, I've got a loving family. Why would anything be wrong with me when really I'm, I'm crying inside? I'm struggling inside. Two things happened to me. I remember one time I was out with the family and a fan came up to me. Um, and said, oh, you're Dean Hammond, aren't you? And for a split second, I said, I almost said, yeah, I used to be. Because I felt as though Dean Hammond was a footballer, not Dean Hammond as a, as a father, as a husband, as a friend, as a son to my parents. I'd lost, that's what I mean about, I'd lost my identity. I didn't know how to in introduce myself or how to describe myself. Another time when very early on, and this is where the problem started for me, really, um, my wife took the children to school um uh all went out the door happy smiling my wife was looking forward to her to a day and i was they shut the door behind me and i was left sitting in the living room and kind of just sat there and went okay what do i do today then what what is my purpose today um and then just started drinking if i'm honest started getting like uh using drink to to help fill that void to make me feel a certain way so i was never like I, did, I wasn't reliant on alcohol. I wasn't an alcoholic, but I was reliant on alcohol to make me feel better. So when I had them moments of feeling down or them dark moments or feeling overwhelmed or, or anxious, I just turned to alcohol because it, it just got rid of the pain, the, the pain that was inside me, the pain that it helped me forget. I became Dean Hammond again, if I'm honest. When I, when I, was, when I was drunk or having a few drinks, I became that, that happy... Um, kind of simple, calm, composed person. Um, and when you feel like that because of alcohol, you think that's the only thing you can get for that feeling. Um, I was quite fortunate that I always stayed fit. So I had that little bit of structure in my life that I would always stay fit, but I was using fitness in the wrong way. I was using fitness as a punishment because of the alcohol. Um, so mentally, I, would, I mean, I wasn't in a good place. I really, really wasn't. It's, I've, I've got very similar experience with, with alcohol and with that and coming out of the game and using it because I said before that I came out and I didn't I came out quite suddenly and it was a little bit different but I didn't know what I was going to do next um, and if I went to bed sober I'd, I'd lay there um, and I'd be thinking constantly right what's next what's what when we're going to do here I'm not financially secure for more than six months so I'm like right I need to get a job I need to do this I need to do that I need to speak to people so I couldn't sleep and I remember coming downstairs and I'd never had beers in my fridge or anything like that as a player because the only time I really drank was if I went out with my mates on the odd weekend or if me and my wife went for a meal or in you know the off season. Apart from that, you have to be really disciplined and I'd never have like crates of beer in my fridge or anything. But I came out and I was like, you know what, I'm going to go to the shop and get like a crate of beers here and just have them in the fridge. And I was like, oh, this is like a Tuesday night. And I was like, I've never been able to do this on a Tuesday night. I just have a few beers because I've always got training in the, in the morning. But I remember doing that and having probably four or five beers, just sat there on my own. My wife was pregnant. She was upstairs just watching telly on my own. I went up to bed and I slept like a baby. And I, the next day I was like, well, that's all right. I'll just have a few beers at night. That'll let me sleep. And then like you, I was still quite active during the day. And I think... Um, it's interesting when you say you turn back into Dean Hammond as well, because when I'd, I'd be quite antisocial during the day and I'd be quiet and I'd be keeping my thoughts to myself, but I'd be sat there having a beer. And even though I was on my own, my phone would come out. I'd start texting people and I'd start sending messages and being a little bit braver than I would. I remember coming, like, coming down the next morning thinking, oh, why have I sent that to an old <laughs> nice. manager? Or why have I sent that to a teammate? Or, you know, why have I sent these messages? And it is the, the drink and it almost did bring me back to that state as well. But I was going to ask you, what was your, what was your relationship like with alcohol throughout your career? Because it's a, it's a thing for me. I didn't start drinking probably until I was 18 or 19. I was, you know, I was never sucked into it by peer pressure in school, anything like that. I had to cut away friends. And I think when I, when I did first start drinking, it was probably to, you know, I'd gone from an all boys school to an all male environment of football then all of a sudden I started to go out with my mates from the youth team. And it was probably for a little bit of confidence. I'd never really been in this, these social situations and, you know, speaking to girls on nights out or dancing and things like that. So I started to, that was my first taste of it. 
but I'd always feel guilty the next day. I'd put a bin bag on and I'd go running because I knew that to be a footballer, this was probably the wrong thing to be doing. So what was your, I just wanted to see what your, what your first experiences were like of alcohol and how it sort of went through your career. Did you use it if you had a bad game or if you were buzzing after a win? How did it sort of pan out in your career? It's probably the first time I've, I've well, lately I've been really honest with myself with alcohol that I'm very similar to yourself, Fraser. I went to an all boys school, um, left school at 16. I hadn't, I didn't try alcohol until I was 18. So I'd not even tried it. You know, my parents drunk, they were, they, they love drink, they love a good drink, but it just didn't interest me because it, I knew it would affect my performances of becoming a professional footballer. But I was quite shy and really quite unconfident um, off the pitch, on the pitch, different person, really was. And I think that was my release. And I think probably why it, it, I, I was quite successful in my career, career because I felt different on the pitch. But off the pitch, you know, club events, social events, really struggled, you know, got called boring on many occasions or got called rude on many occasions because I would sit there in silence because I just wasn't confident in myself to talk to anyone, really. I didn't feel as though I had anything of value to say until I'd had a drink. And if I had a drink, I felt really confident. You know, I became quite funny. And, and then a drink got associated with me, you know, like I was, I was the boring footballer, but I was, I was, I was kind of funny when, when, I, when I had a drink. And that then become my remit. If I went out for a social event, I knew I needed a drink. You know, I wouldn't go out without having a couple of drinks at home before I went to have a drink to make me feel at ease, to try and put that mask on, to try and feel easier about myself because I just wasn't confident in myself off the pitch. I didn't, I couldn't accept myself off the pitch for whatever reason that is. Is it through my childhood? I'm not sure. I mean, I suffered with horrendous acne when I was coming through the youth team and early ages as a professional. So I don't think that helped really. I think I suffered through that and that, that suffered with my confidence. But I definitely used alcohol um, to help me in social events. I didn't particularly like it. I didn't particularly like the person I became. But it made life easier for me because I came a little bit popular off the pitch because I was the idiot who was drunk um, and, and kind of got accepted as that and then um, felt better at the training ground and on the pitch because I was accepted where, same as you, the next day I'd wake up full of guilt, full of why am I doing this? I'm affecting my career. Just have confidence in yourself not to drink. Um, you know, and I'm, I'm now, I haven't, I, like, I haven't had a drink for a year now. So I, I've completely changed as a person. I just feel more confident within myself. Um, but definitely during my career, I used alcohol to help me in, in them, the, the male orientated environment uh, that I struggled with. It's, it's interesting speaking to different players about this because it's, it's a topic that I've never seen myself. I've never had a, an alcohol problem or anything like that. I've, I've gone weeks and months without drinking and, it's not something, you know, it's something I feel like I've got con complete control of. But I think when you deprived yourself as footballers and you know that, you know, you have to be disciplined and you can't really do what your mates are doing. Sometimes it seems like they're having a good time and you're not. But I think this is sometimes within football, when you've got a Christmas do or something like that as well, there's such a build up to it and you deprive yourself full of alcohol and all this kind of stuff. And then, you, you know, your manager says, right, you've got a weekend, go and do your thing. Everyone goes nuts. And it is because you, you've deprived yourself from, right, I've got this one weekend, I need to drink as much as I can. And I've seen players obviously do ridiculous things and could probably write a book on Christmas dues. But then you go, you've also then got, right, my season finishes, I've probably got a month. And, you know, boys will use that month and they'll cram everything into that month and then be disciplined again throughout the year. And then I think when you come out is when you think, oh, you know what, this, you know, I can, I can act like this now. I've not got to get up in the morning. And for me, when I started to, probably see changes in my body you know you, you have to be in good shape as a player and I started to feel like not as good about myself um I started one of the probably things that highlighted it for me was I started hiding alcohol I'd never mm. do that because I've got a strong I've always had a strong mum who would tell me off if I had a drink um so I always used to hide it from her but I've got a strong wife as well and it'd be fine if I had you know three beers in the evening and she wouldn't she wouldn't you know tell me off or anything like that but if I had five or six, she'd be like, well, like, slow yourself down, you know, and, and tell me off for it. So I remember I used to come in and I'd have like three beers or something in the fridge, but I'd put one in the freezer or I'd hide one around, the, you know, in the garden or something like that. So she thought I was only drinking that and I'd pour it into a glass. And that's when for me, it was only 
probably two or three months after I retired. But that was probably a wake up call for me. Did you have any kind of wake up call or one moment where you thought, right, that's enough. I need to, you know, I need to make this change. And you've said that you've got a year about alcohol now. Was there one moment or is it like a build up of, of small moments? Definitely a build up of small moments. There was no, there's no major life event that happened that suddenly stopped me from, from drinking. Um, but there was definitely little moments of, of being hung over and missing things with the kids. Um, not having structure in my life, a bit like yourself, just feeling guilty all the time after I'd had a drink. So there was little moments like that. And, and similar to yourself, Fraser, I would go to 12 weeks without drinking then, but it was different then. There was always the target at the end and I'd have a blowout with my mates. But I was so insecure as a person. And it's, it may be a surprise to people because I've had a career like I did in, in the game. I was so insecure as a person off the pitch, so shy, really, really was. I had to fight with myself all the time to build up. You know, I used to prepare conversations with people before I met them, thinking, you know, I'm, this is what I need to speak about. That's what they're interested in because I didn't want people feeling badly of me or thinking I didn't want to be labelled as rude or boring again. I'd have enough, had enough of that. I, so a major thing, not anything major, I just remember waking up, about let's say just over a year ago waking up one morning i'd had a big night out with friends i got in about four o'clock in the morning um the, the missus and the kids had gone out i'd not even realized i'd had that that much to drink because they'd gone out i didn't even hear them go and i remember just looking at myself in the mirror and going is this it then is this your life is this everything you've worked towards and is this is how it's going to be from you now just going out getting drunk waking up missing things with the kids um because i love my kids dearly and i've always been I feel as though I've always been a really, really good dad. Um, I've dedicated my life to being a good dad and being there for them. And I love being a dad and, and being a good husband. But during that period, there was periods where I wasn't. And I just remember looking in the mirror and going, it was almost a fight came back in with me. I was almost like, nah, this ain't happening. I'm not going out like this. This is not how my life's going to pan out. I've not worked this hard on myself as a person and in my football career. And I just stopped. That was it. I didn't tell anyone. I didn't suddenly make this big announcement that I'm not drinking anymore. I just stopped. And then after a few months, people were going, you're not drinking anymore. And you just go, yep, just having a break from it. And I didn't make excuses up. I didn't go out and make excuses and go, oh, I've got a drive or um, I've got um, a hit class in the morning. or I've got something important to mind, so I'm not having a drink. I just being honest with myself and honest with other people. And I was like, I'm, not, I'm just not drinking at the moment and didn't put a label on it. And so that was the major thing, looking at myself in the mirror and, and probably just for the first time in a long time, being honest with myself and looking at myself and going, nah, this, this ain't happening to me. No chance. Um, uh, there was a bit of fight that came back in me. And Dean, it brings us quite nicely to the word purpose comes up, finding a purpose. Um, you lost your purpose later on in your career. Um, but then you kind of rediscovered it with going back to one of your old clubs at, at Leicester City. And I was really fascinated to, to, to hear about that. You, you, going back and being in the football environment and finding the ability to use your experience and kind of, I guess it comes back to the positivity it talks about, you know, the new generation coming through and what you can do and what you were able to do when you went back to Leicester for a little while. Yeah, I mean, that was probably the best thing that, that happened to me, um, to be honest. I felt as though I had value in my life again and it did give me a bit of, of purpose to be able to pass on some experience so when I was at a loss and I was going through on and off diff period different difficult periods um I remember getting a phone call from the 23s manager at Leicester City who I'd always had a good relationship with um and just asked if I'd come in and, and speak to the to the younger players they were bottom of the league at the time in the 23s they had a lot of injuries um so they had a really young team and squad and he said look they're hearing the same voice day in, day out from me. Would you come in and just speak to them? So I was like, look, brilliant, love to come in. Went in, spent a couple of days with them, spoke to them um, collectively and individually. And then obviously he saw that I was still fit and I was still training at the time on my own. He said, look, would you train? So I ended up training with the, with the boys, which I loved because I would love training. I think it's the best bit. Um, trained for a couple of weeks and he said, look, will you play? Because at 23, you can play over age players. So I was like, I was like, no, I don't really want to play because I still wasn't in love with the game. I was just like, look, I'm kind of happy to be out of the limelight, just be around the training ground and speak to him. And in the end, he persuaded me to play. We played Brighton, actually, the first game. Um, and we ended up, I ended up playing about 10 games. We ended up staying up in the end, um, which was great. Gave me a real 
sense of pride again, to be honest, and a bit of purpose. And that focus, it gave me like a three month focus. So in that period, I stopped drinking. I didn't drink. I was happier. I felt alive again. Um, and then got offered the loan manager's role uh, at the club, which is a brilliant role. You look after the players that go out on loan. Um, you go and watch them play. You go and watch them train. Um, you speak to them. I looked after Harvey Barnes at, when he was at West Bromwich Albion. That was a brilliant experience. And again, you feel value again. You feel as though you've got a purpose in life. I know that sounds really over the top, but because I've got a family and I've got kids and that was, that is a purpose, but I needed an individual purpose. I needed a purpose for Dean Hammond again. I needed to be Dean Hammond and having that role was, was fantastic. It really, really was and uh, really helped me. Um, but I seem to always get little setbacks. You know, my wife then had a really poor back and had an operation on her back and she was out for um, months and I had to then give the role up and I became a full-time dad for um, three or four months, which, which I love. Don't get me wrong, I love, but it, it kind of set me back a little bit because then I lost my way again, as in Dean Hammond. Um, so, but the, the time at Leicester was fantastic. It really, really was. It's so beneficial. And I think, if I'm honest, this is just my opinion from going through it, I think clubs are missing a trick. And they're missing a trick of bringing former players back into football clubs to help the, the next generation, whatever level that is. Now, the clubs need to choose the right players. That's important. You can't just bring anyone back. So it's got to be the right players to do it. But there's a lot of good players out there, good people out there that probably don't appreciate of how much they can help the younger players just through speaking about their real life experience and just by speaking to what the journey is going to be like. And I think this is really, really important. If clubs can get their head round of bringing players back, um, then I think it could really help because during that period, I feel as though I helped the players. And I'll tell you one thing, them players and that club helped me massively. And I think it could work both ways. We talk about players coming out of the game and struggling, um, not having purpose, struggling financially. I mean, what's the stat? One in three are, are bankrupt or divorced within three years of finishing the game. If they could go back into the clubs and feel as though they've got a bit of a purpose again and build a structure from there, I think you could, the club and the player could help each other. I was going to say it's something that I'm doing at the minute with with a, one, a club that me and Matt work with, and you do say I, I come away from it feeling quite fulfilled, and then the player also because he relates to you and he knows that you've gone through it, and you're a little bit you're not picking the team, you're not with him every single day, you, you're involved with the club, but you're a little bit external. I think he's there for, he's willing to open up and speak about different things. I think often if you've got, and I'm not saying this happens, but if you've got someone in the club. Sometimes you think, right, if I tell him something, that might get back to the coach or, you know, I might not be playing at the weekend if, if he tells him that I'm struggling a little bit. And that's not right. But I, th I still think there's that kind of mentality as a player that oh, I might hold back from telling that person that. But if you give me someone a little bit outside and that's been through some of my experiences, I think you find that the player wants to open up a little bit more and is willing to open up a little bit more. It's definitely something that I've found. But I agree with you. There's... It has to be the right person and they've got to be upskilled and they've got to be be able to pass on the right advice. But there's a massive, massive market for it for me. Um, now, Dean, one way in which you do help, you've been helping a lot of fellas to get fit and you, you've said to us before, fitness saved me. And I guess you're, 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 you're trying to give back in that respect. So you've got Dean Hammond Fitness um, and I really like the strap line, so I'm going to nick it. Well, I'm not going to nick it for myself, but we're going to use it. Re reignite your purpose. It's quite nice that that kind of that idea of purpose that runs through your career. You lost your purpose, you gained your purpose, you lost your purpose, you gained your purpose. Um, so tell us a little bit about Dean Hammond Fitness and, and what it is that, that, that you guys do. Well, it is, it's, it's home fitness. So it's all fitness from home. And, and the premises of it is, like you say, it's to reignite your purpose through football and fitness. So everything I've learned through football in terms of fitness, in terms of life skills, it's about passing that on. It's about having structure in your life. So I always perform their, their live hit classes um, four times a week um, in the mornings because I honestly believe them from what I've learned from my um, success and through my struggles is that if you can start the day well, the rest of it just kind of flows. So it's building that foundation of your day. And I think a lot of that comes through exercise. Now, I've always been the most confident. I felt the best about myself when I've been the fittest. And that's just my opinion, but this is what I try and do at 
um, f through the Dean Hammond Elite Fitness. And we do, like I say, four hit classes a week. I do a live, um, not a live, I do a recorded um, Sunday evening. It's called a team talk. So me and um, a, a friend, um, we do, uh, we answer questions of the members. So we have a members group, the members that do the, the fitness classes. They can ask us any questions, football related, fatherhood, um, life, well-being, any questions they got and we discuss it. So I'm not just answering questions. It's a bit like what we do here, but we, we discuss um, the issues that members are having. Um, and then they can, they, it gets loaded and they can watch it up on, on a Monday and, and kind of reflect on that themselves. So it's having that support and that accountability, a little bit like we just mentioned with the mentoring, just having someone there to help you that's, that's been through it. Now, I'm not qualified in anything, but I've got a lot of life skills and a life experiences. And I think that's almost a qualification in itself. So anything I pass on, anything advice on fitness or any fitness workouts I do, um, it's just through what I've experienced that, that works for me. Um, and it's all stuff that I did during my career. You know, I would do the extra little bits away from the training ground, the extra fitness bits, the extra. You know, I used to bounce the ball around my, my living room when I, was, when I was playing in the Premier League. It was just little bits that I used to do to try and give me that edge. So it's just passing on and um, that I'm, I'm hoping it's helping a few people. But again, it's, it's definitely helping me because it gives me accountability and it gives me structure in my life. We've gone through that and we're, we're, we're getting the chance to speak to you now when you seem like you're in a great position in your life and things are looking up and looking really positive you've gone a year without alcohol and you know your fitness is a massive part of your routine in your life now is it um i know you didn't you weren't an alcoholic or alcohol dependent you used it but is it a, is it a thing that you can see yourself you know do you never want to touch a drop again or are you going to slowly introduce and you know be able to control it it's a great question, um, Fraser. It really is because I get I asked it all the time because I get asked when's Fun Ding coming back out. So it's <laughs> it's one of those that <laughs> I have to smile at and obviously like I look, uh, and I'm quite comfortable with myself now. I've I've learned to um, accept myself and appreciate myself. But um, no, one thing I've, I've that I've really spent a lot of time on invested in myself is understanding myself a lot more and, and accepting myself. And I understand that me and alcohol just don't mix. Look, I've, I haven't got, I can't turn it off. I'm not one of those people that can have two or three beers on a Sunday afternoon with a nice roast. As soon as it touches my lips, I'm off. It's like a, I'm like a caged animal that's caged and then the door gets opened and I've got, I just get let out as soon as it touched my lip and I haven't got a turn off button. But I understand that now and I'm okay with that. I've got no problem with that now. And I didn't, I didn't understand that. So, you know, I speak to people and they're like, how have you done it? How have you got off alcohol? I can't get off it. And, and I'm more like, it's not necessarily your issue, issue with alcohol. It's your, it's your understanding yourself and accepting yourself. I think that's a big thing for all of us in life to, to accept yourself and, and just understand what you want in life. Not from a selfish point of view, but what do you want to do in life? Not what other people are going to influence you, what other people expect of you. What do you actually want to do? And I think once you can start putting that together and putting a plan together like you would financially, if you can put a plan together to, for your life and head towards something, um, I think you uh, you kind of get rid of them distractions. So, you know, every time I, I fancy a drink because I, I want to release, I find something else to do that I found interesting. So at the moment, never say never but I can't really see myself drinking again because I think if I did, it would put me back a long, long way. And I don't think I'm willing to go through all that pain again. Do you know what's great there, Dean? Is we started off, we talked about being a youth team player at the beginning and the prospects of whether or not you make it. And we talked about awareness and understanding. And then we get right to the end, um, understanding and awareness, being able to control things and being on top of things. So it's, it's absolutely beautifully put together and I, I, I hesitated then because I was about to say as an older man so you are I think I'm right to say 38 um, 38 yeah quite self-interested here I'm 41 a little bit older than you um we're still <laughs> young men we've got a lot of life left to live and it's something Jamie Carragher said actually we interviewed him for our series one about the Liverpool lads and he talks about football ages everyone everyone assumes that you know when you're a footballer and you're 30 and you talked about being a footballer over 30 everyone thinks you're old you're not old at that stage. You might have lived an incredible life, which has matured you incredibly. But I think it's really important that we put our lives 
in these phases and we plan out for these phases as well and it's important that we we enjoy our 30s and you'll be soon joining me in my 40s uh, as well Dean so it's really important we enjoy these these later years as well. I totally agree with you and I, do you know what I'm looking forward to it now it's it's taken this time but I'm I feel as though my life's starting again and I can start to look back on, on, on my career with a bit of pride. You know, I had my medals and shirts tucked away in the garage for four or five years, didn't want to know about them, went through a period of not wanting to play football with my son, wasn't interested. Um, but having that focus and looking forward to life is good. And I'm almost at that. It's good because everything I do now, I can associate back to football. I can go what well, it was like this period. It was like this phase, like you mentioned there, Matt. And I just feel like I'm a YTS boy again now. You know, I'm starting out in my new career and I love my YTS days. So why can't I love these days? Yes, there's different pressures. Yes, I've got to provide for my family. Yes, I've got three children. And there's some pressures and some anxiety there, but that's life. There's always been that. But because I've had focus, I probably never realised that they were there in my life, if that makes sense. I was just so driven to get somewhere I didn't appreciate that I was probably feeding them feelings. And as you get older, understand yourself a bit more, speak to other people like we're doing on here. Um, you come to understand those feelings, but I do feel young again because I'm like, where a year ago I thought my life was over in terms of I'm just going to bumble along now and I've had my best part of my life. I don't feel like that anymore. I don't know what's coming up. I don't know where this is going to take me, but I feel as though I've got some value to 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 give back and some value to pass on. So I'm looking forward to seeing where it's going to take me. But then it's been an absolute privilege to talk to you. Um, some incredible pearls of wisdom on that. And uh, well, it just remains for me to say, well, thank you for joining the podcast. My pleasure, guys. It really is. Thanks for listening to this episode of Football Journeys. Um, and thank you to all those who supported us. Do come and find us on social media at Journeys Pod on both Twitter and Instagram, where we'll be sharing more content. If you want to get in touch with us, you can email us on footballjourneys at b5consultancy.com or visit our webpage, b5consultancy.com slash footballjourneys. Please do like and subscribe. If you feel we deserve a five-star rating, then please give us one. The more successful this podcast is, the better chance we have of producing more, more episodes and further series.